Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to this webinar detailing the Emerging Investigator Awards for Health for 2022. I'm Anne Costello and also with us on the line here is Dr. Annalisa Montesanti, who manages the Health Research Careers portfolio. So just so you know, there is a question submission facility which will be open during the course of the webinar. So please do submit anything that you would like us to address and we will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. So in terms of what we're going to talk about today, um, we'll go over first the research careers portfolio, uh, which includes the emerging investigators, some objectives of the scheme, the health research remits, so some scope, uh, who should apply, so the suitability of the lead applicants as well as the eligibility, the research team, uh, so that's the co-applicants and the mentor as well as the lead applicant, the funding that's available and also um, some budget tips, uh, the application and review process, the assessment criteria, some other important aspects of the scheme close to the end, and then I'll go over the timeline from start to finish. And at the end, we'll go through some top tips that you should take note of just before um, starting your application. So in terms of the Emerging Investigator Awards for Health uh, 2022, it is part of the Health Research Careers Portfolio, and it is designed to support new independent investigators who can facilitate actionable knowledge in health research. Um, and the Health Research Careers Portfolio, it does support people right the way through from undergraduate all of the way through to research leaders. So within the Health Research Careers Portfolio, the HRB supports two separate career paths. One is for academic researchers, which is illustrated here, and the other is an entirely separate career path to support health and career practitioners. So the main funding calls supported under the Health Research Careers are, well, it actually it starts with um, the student scholarships, which aren't actually in this infographic, but which is a very important uh, scheme. It's a funding call for undergraduates who would like to gain some experience in research um, before they've really decided whether they want to actually go down the, the research career route or not. So while it's not here, it is an important one. So then we have the collaborative doctoral awards for a PhD stage. Um, and each of these awards are in a specific field of research and support four to five PhDs within a consortium. Then at fellowship stage, we have the ARP fellowships, so that's applying research into policy and practice. Uh, and on the academic side, and then on the clinician scientist awards fellowship, uh, uh, on the clinician scientist awards fellowships is on the health and care practitioner side, which is here. So in terms of the EIA, the EIA sits here underneath transition to independence. And that is on the academic side. It does have a sister scheme, Emerging Clinician Scientist Awards, on the health and care practitioner track. And this is due to be launched kind of early next year. Finally, then, on these career paths, we do have the leaderships. We have transition to leadership for on the academic side as research leader awards. And on the clinician side is clinician scientist awards. And that will be coming over the next couple of years. So in terms of the scheme objectives then, uh, the main, there are two main objectives. And the first is support to support talented individuals at a critical career transition stage to establish themselves as independent health investigators in an academic or other research-based institution. And the second is to develop collaborative research who can facilitate actionable knowledge by translating knowledge generated through research into the healthcare system, policies and practice, or generating research findings informed by policy and practice. So ultimately, the EIA award supports researchers by providing them with their very first research grant as independent investigators. The benefits here are twofold as it supports their career development in terms of skill sets, competencies, collaborative approaches, and the knowledge that they will gain over the course of their award. It also maximizes actionable knowledge to the benefit of patients, populations, and society as a whole, really. So basically, the objectives focus on the development of the researcher, but also on the research evidence that they will produce. So in terms of the uh, research remit for the scheme, the first one is patient-oriented research, which is research conducted with human subjects or on material of human origin, such as tissues, specimens and cognitive phenomena. And this research generally involves patients or patient samples or data from patients as well as others who are not patients, so healthy volunteers, for example, as controls. The next one then is population health research. So research, this is research with the goal of improving health of the health of the population or of defined subpopulation. It doesn't have to be the entire population. So this type of research can lead to better understandings of the ways that social, you know, cultural, environmental, occupational, economic factors will determine 
how those factors will determine health status. It includes or can include the identification of effective interventions for improving health status and reducing health inequalities, which is very important. But then is health services research. So this is research with the goal of improving efficiency and effectiveness uh, of health professionals and the healthcare system through changes to practice and policy. So HSOR, it's generally multidisciplinary. It includes social factors, financing systems, organizational structures and processes, health technologies, and personal behaviours, and it looks at how these factors affect access to healthcare, the quality and cost of healthcare, and ultimately health and wellbeing. So I'm going to talk a bit about suitability for the EIA scheme. Who should apply? So in terms of suitability, it is it is distinct from eligibility. So suitability and eligibility are different, and I'll talk, to, I'll talk about eligibility a little bit later on. So the EIA supports postdoctoral researchers predominantly. These are our target group for this call. Postdoctoral researchers who can make a valuable contribution to their research field and who are capable of becoming independent and self-directed investigators. Applicants should be able to demonstrate a contribution to scientific knowledge to illustrate their potential to become collaborative and independent researchers. So you do need some experience in this field, but not so much that you are already an independent investigator. The call, another important aspect is that the call is now only open to academic researchers. In the previous round of the call, there was two arms. One was clinical, one was academic. The EIA is now only supporting academic researchers who are engaged in health research related um, activities, mainly in academic or other research institutions. It doesn't mean that we are excluding clinicians, of course not, we just have a whole other career path which is dedicated to them. So individuals who are health and care practitioners and are involved in the delivery of healthcare are not eligible for the EIA, but they should apply to the Emerging Clinician Scientist Award, which is the sister scheme at this career level. The next round of that scheme is will be coming in early, early next year. So now, in terms of the eligibility criteria, um, Lead applicants can be postdoctoral researchers of, with, with uh, fixed term uh, postdoctoral researchers with contracts of any duration. And as I say, postdoctoral researchers are really the target for this call. You can be currently on a career break or working outside of the academic setting. You can be currently working overseas, and that's fine. You must have a PhD or you must have been granted PhD equivalents by the HRD, HRB before the uh, deadline of the call. And HRB equivalents is if you don't have a PhD qualification, but you do have four years or more of active research experience that could be um, attributed to a PhD, the equivalent of a PhD. So if you think you have PhD equivalents, you should contact us and try to ensure that you have your PhD equivalents before the deadline of the call, which is the 19th of August. You must also have at least four years of active post PhD or equivalent research experience. Um, and that means that you should have defended your PhD at a minimum in 2017, assuming that you have no gaps in your active research since then. So the lead applicant eligibility criteria must not, you cannot hold a permanent position, academic or other, or a fixed term position, academic or other, with a contracted end date equal to or later than two years from the deadline of this call. This does not apply to postdoctoral researchers on a fixed term contract supported under an award. You cannot be as yet recognised as an independent investigator by having already received an award in Ireland or abroad targeting the career stage of transitioning towards research independence. So an award similar to EIA. If you've already had an award similar to EIA, then you won't be eligible. Um, you, by already having built a research team, by securing as lead applicant any peer-reviewed research grant which supports research personnel, and that's an important point. If you have a grant as lead applicant that doesn't support research personnel, personnel then you are still eligible. By acting as the past or present primary supervisor or sponsor of an early career scholarship or fellowship, so a PhD or a postdoc who has uh, who has gained their own award, so awarded to another individual. You can't be the named supervisor of that person on their award. You cannot be already recognised by your host institution as an independent investigator, and that is something that will be checked at pre-application stage as we do require a letter of support confirming that you are not as yet independent. So we have an infographic here to try to explain this in, in kind of visual terms. So if you're a postdoctoral research on a fifth term contract of any duration, you fulfill eligibility. If you're a healthcare practitioner, you cannot apply to this call, but you can apply to ECSA. 
if you're an academic, so example would be a lecturer or a research organization staff member, for instance, then if you have a contract of less than two years, you can apply. If you are a permanent or have a contract longer than two years, you cannot apply to this call. So once you have established that you are an eligible researcher type, you can then look at your funding record. So if you have funding as co-applicant or collaborator, that's fine, you're eligible. If you do not have funding, that's fine, you're eligible, but you may want to check your suitability in terms of your research outputs. If you have funding as a PI or co-PI, and it does not support any research staff like PhD students or A's, any, any research staff at all, then you are still eligible. If you have funding as PI and it does support research staff, then you are an independent investigator and you are not eligible for this call. Additionally, if you have previously received an award like EIA from abroad or from any other funding agency, you would not be eligible. So in terms of uh, research independence, there are two further items that you have to consider in terms of research independence, which might impact your eligibility. You know now that you're an eligible researcher, you have an appropriate funding record. If you're a named supervisor on an award, on a fellowship which has been um, secured by somebody else, then you're not eligible. You're already independent as you're a supervisor, as your main supervisor. And you should note as well that a letter of support from your HI is required at pre-application stage. If the HI cannot confirm that you are as yet not recognised as an independent investigator, then you are not eligible. You must, the letter of support must confirm that you are not as yet recognised as an independent investigator. So it is important um, to be aware at this point that the IA really does focus on emerging investigators, not people who are already independent investigators. So while there's no upper limit of post-PhD experience a person may have, uh, they should still consider whether they are actually at the career stage of emerging investigator in terms of if quite a lot of time has passed since their PhD. This speaks to the suitability of the candidates and while you may be eligible, there is a chance you may not be suitable. So people who are less suitable should be aware that they may are less likely to be comp competitive in terms of uh, in the context of the assessment criteria, which I'll cover uh, soon. So just keep that in mind. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the research team. So the proposal must have a team-based and collaborative approach. It has to contain the necessary breadth and depth of expertise in all methodologies, skills and competencies required. Uh, you know, you have to have the expertise there to be able to carry out the proposal, the proposed research that you are suggesting that you, you undertake. You must have an appropriate cross-disciplinary and a cross-border intersectoral approach as relevant to address the research question. So dependent on whether your, your proposal requires this type of interdisciplinary or intersectoral approach. You should have health researchers and or professionals, innovators as appropriate to address the research question. Um, you should have um, stakeholder engagement. You must be able to uh, show that you have appropriate stakeholder engagement that has enabled you to develop the research question in terms of what is needed by the community, what's needed by the patients. And um, it should, you know, it should really be experts by experience, such as patients, potential patients, service users, carers, they're all welcome to be included in the research team, either as co-applicants or at full application stage as collaborators. And it's good, you can also have decision makers, policy makers, knowledge users, health agencies, healthcare professionals, etc. So they have to be involved, if they're, in, if they're involved in the development of the research question, they should be involved from, throughout the entire research process to ensure that the evidence generated by the research can be integrated into policy and practice in an effective way that will impact positively, positively, impact, positively impact patients. So in terms of the research team members then, you will need a mentor. A lead applicant has to nominate a mentor who will provide them with support and guidance on their research, their research vision, their career milestones. But you also have the option to include a local mentor who is based in the same institution or department. Um, and this is for the purpose of providing more career specific and perhaps institutionally relevant guidance. And this would be quite important for people who may be entering a new institution or are taking up the award from abroad, for example. You also have co-applicants. So you are able to include up to five co-applicants in the application. However, you also have the option of including your mentor as a co-applicant. So if you choose to include your mentor as a co-applicant, you can add an additional four co-applicants to your application. 
Collaborators can be included up to 10 collaborators, but only at full application stage. Uh, collaborator inf information is only required at full application stage. So if you do try to kind of sneak it in at pre-application stage, there is a chance that you're you're, you're you're just not going to be using your word count effectively because in terms of the assessment criteria, it's really not going to be taken into account what collaborators you have at pre-application stage. So just to have a note of that. So in terms of the funding then that is available for the award, the EIA is the first of two rounds planned for the, the current HRB strategy, which just launched this year. Uh, it's expected that there will be an investment of, of up to 7 million to support nine awards in this round. Over the course of the strategy, we do intend to run two rounds of the EIA scheme over the five years. Um, so this will be a total investment of 14 million, approximately 14 million supporting up to 18 emerging investigators. So the budget then, the budget must reflect the scale and nature of you are proposing. It has to be appropriate for what you're actually pro proposing to do. What's really important is the budget has to include the salary of the lead applicant to ensure protected research time to conduct the research. Um, so all applicants should request a salary of IA, IUA level, level 3.1 and this is regardless of their previous remuneration or whether their previous salary is lower. Um, and it's in recognition of the applicant's career stage upon receiving an EIA award. You can, if you are remunerated or if your salary is higher than level 3.1, then you can request a maximum of level 3.4. Um, but you, at applications to at award stage, you would need to provide proof that your current remuneration is more than level 3.1 in that instance. So the research related costs are capped at a maximum value of 300,000. So the research related costs are basically everything, every direct research cost except the lead applicant salary. So you have your, you, you may have personnel, you may have personnel salaries um, in the research related costs, you have your running costs, you have, um, maybe you have training, you will have training, you will have dissemination. Um, but it's important to note that dissemination is actually capped at 15,000 and that will be in support basically of the conferences, the international and national conferences that you want to attend and your research staff want to attend and also the publications. Um, if you do have additional uh, dissemination such as outreach, it is possible to justify an additional amount for that type of, of dissemination. So the overhead contribution, the indirect costs of the award is the overhead contribution which will be given to the HI and this will be calculated at award stage. It won't be part of the budget negotiation process. Um, at the close of budget negotiations of the direct costs, the HRB will then calculate the overhead contribution and add it to the total of the award and we're looking at uh, an approximately 800,000 which will be inclusive of overheads. Okay, so now on to the application and the review process. So the Emerging Investigator Awards for Health uses a two-stage application process. Um, so we have the open call for pre-applications, which is currently ongoing. And then we have the invitation of selected applicants to submit a full application. So the pre-application stage form then, it includes information on the track record of the lead applicant to date and that's the full information of the lead applicant to date. Uh, the second part then is an outline of the research project which will focus on the relevance of the proposed project and the potential for actionable knowledge and this is a section that will be considerably expanded upon in the full application so it is an outline. And the third part is then details of the core research team. So that's the mentor and the co-applicants. And that will be full details of the core research team, mentor and co-applicants. No information yet for the collaborators, which will come in at a full application stage. So the pre-application review process then is quite a bit shorter than the full application. We have the submission deadline on the 19th of August. Um, we'll take a couple of weeks to ensure that all of the applications are eligible um, in terms of scope and lead applicant uh, criteria. And at the beginning of September, we will be sending the ap eligible applications to the panel members. Um, so they will have three or four weeks to compile their reviews before they meet for a shortlisting panel review in October, the second week in October. And it will be the following week, very shortly thereafter, that we will be notifying all of the applicants of the outcome and inviting the uh, shortlisted candidates to submit a full application. We'll open at, point, at that point, we'll be opening the full application stage. 
So in terms of the pre-application stage review, so eligible pre-applications will be subjected to international panel review and will be ranked based on three separate assessment criteria, which will be separately subscored. So we have the potential of the lead applicant to become an independent investigator, the relevance of the research question and the potential for actionable knowledge, the fit of the research team with the research question and the objective to facilitate actionable knowledge. So those are the three assessment criteria that each application will be assessed on. The panel will make recommendation on a selected number of lead applicants to be invited to submit a full application. At full application stage then, the form expands considerably on the proposed research and there are three steps to the full application review. First of all, the submitted applications will be subjected to international peer review and public review. So peer reviewers focus on the assessment criteria and public reviewers assess only the quality of the PPI in the proposal. Now each peer reviewer who is um, secured will be only assessing your application. So we will secure peer reviewers, at least peer review, three peer reviewers for each application each uh, that is submitted and uh, those peer reviewers will be in your field of research and will assess only your application. Once the peer review stage is complete and all of the peer reviews and the public reviews have been submitted, we will open an applicant response phase. So the applicants will be sent the peer review and the uh, public review comments and they will be given a time limit opportunity, 10 days to respond to those peer and public review comments. There is a word count on the applicant response of 2,500, but it's separated into peer review response and public review response. So there's 2,000 words for the peer review response, which should only be dedicated to the peer review response and there's 500 dedicated to the public review response on the, on the applicant response form and those are separate sections on that form. So once the applicant response has been submitted, we will take the applicant response, the full application form, the comments from the peer reviewers, the public review and the public reviewers, and also the feedback document that was sent to the applicants at pre-application stage. And we will send those to the interview review panel members who are going to be assessing your full application. It's important to note that all lead applicants will be invited to submit, who are invited to submit a full application will be invited to attend an interview. There is no further shortlisting stage. If you're submitting a full application, you will be invited to interview. So in terms of the assessment criteria then, um, the assessment criteria will be used to assess applications by peer reviewers and the interview panel members. So it's the same criteria on that each will look at. Successful applications will be expected to rate highly in all three of the criteria. So at full application stage, we're looking at applicant, which is the potential of the lead applicant to become an investigator as evidenced by their track record and research vision, similar to the pre-application stage. And we also have the research project. So we have the relevance of the research question and potential for actionable knowledge. And we also importantly have the appropriate research design and methodology to address the research question. That is additional to the pre-application stage. The third aspect then is the fit of the research team with the research question and the expertise required to facilitate actionable knowledge, the suitability of the mentors and the host institution support during the award. So the assessment criteria is weighted slightly different to the last round. So we have applicant at 40 percent, research project at 30 percent and support at 30 percent. So each of these are sub scored and the final score is the calculated weighted average of the three sub scores. And the applicant is given a slightly heavier weighting in light of the fact that the EIA is a career development award within the Health Research Careers portfolio. So there are a few other important aspects of the scheme. Um, the HRB is a signatory of the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, which is DORA. So the EIA application form includes a narrative CV, which allows the applicant to highlight non-metric associated research outputs, like research data and databases, uh, research material, audiovisual projects, products and uh, reports, briefs, any statistical models, protocols, software, any evidence of influencing policy or practice, outreach or knowledge exchange activities, media coverage, basically any other research related relevant activity. So this type of information in your CV allows a holistic assessment of the applicant based on their full, their actual contributions to their research field. The second aspect of the scheme then is the data management and sharing plan. So data management plans are widely accepted now as part of good research practice. The HRB drives the making of research data fair, so we, it has to be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And this benefits science 
but overall by increasing the reuse of data and by promoting transparency and accountability. So the full application form does include a question on your data management plan. Um, you should describe your approach to compiling a data management plan. There are data stewards available in the HIs who are trained uh, by the HRB who can help you with the preparation of your DMP outline for the form and also the associated budget. So there is a specific budget category dedicated to data management at full application stage. So in line with the HRB's policy on management and sharing of research data, all successful applicants will have to, will have to submit a completed data management plan to the HRB at the beginning of the award and then a final updated version of the DMP with their last annual report. So another very important aspect is patient public and carer involvement and it's an important aspect of all research and there is a specific question on PPI incorporated into the application at pre-application stage and is expanded upon the full application stage. So the HRB promotes the active involvement of members of the public, patients and carers in the research that we fund. Public patient and carer involvement is research carried out with or by members of the public rather than to about or for them. We do recognise that the nature and extent of meaning, meaningful public involvement is likely to vary uh, depending on the context of your research. So it may be useful to note the difference between participation and involvement when it comes to PPI. So recruitment of study participants, for example, in research projects, this is participation, it's not involvement. Um, outreach activities to raise public awareness, you know, really great, very important, but again, not PPI. So in the uh, guidance notes, there is an appendix, uh, appendix number three, you will find some very useful resources on, on DORA, on data, manage um, data management and on PPI, amongst other useful links. And um, so it will be useful to, to check that out. So in terms of the timeline then, for the pre-application stage, it opened on the 2nd of June. Uh, the deadline is the 19th of August. By the 3rd of September, we will be sending the eligible applications to the panel. We will hold the panel meeting the second week in October and following that we will send out notification to all of the applicants and the notification and invitation to full application stage for those selected applicants. At full application stage, which is mid-January, submission of full applications uh, will be mid-January. Uh, at mid-April then, from January to April, we'll, we will have the peer and public review process. Early May will be the applicant response phase. Um, and in the first week in June, we intend to have the interview panel meeting. So um, date for your diary there. So end of June, June will be the board approval. And after the board approval, we will go into budget negotiations and contracting. So the earliest start date for these awards will be November next year onwards. So now just to finish up, I'm going to go through some top tips that you really should take note of before you start your application. You should read the guidance notes carefully. Those guidance notes are there for a reason and every word in them is relevant to your application. So it's important to make sure that you do read them carefully. It's a good idea to ask your current sponsor, your current supervisor uh, or your mentor about your career stage. Are you actually ready to transition to research independence? Are you already research independent? Are you a suitable candidate for EIA? And sometimes touching base with your supervisor or mentor on this can be very useful. Um, there's more information on pa in pages eight and nine of the guidance notes in terms of um, your suitability. If you know you're suitable, you should be very confident that you're eligible to apply. If you're unsure after watching the webinar, after reading the guidance notes, please do contact me so that we can confirm. We won't be able to confirm anything um, officially until after the close, until the eligibility section, until the eligibility stage of the pre-application review, but um, we can certainly help you to determine whether you think you're eligible or not. You should select an appropriate mentor, somebody who can guide you on your way through the award and somebody who is looking not only at your research but also at your career. Ensure that your research question is clear and how it will be addressed is laid out coherently in the proposal. Make sure that you are addressing a research gap, that there is a need um, within the research, that you're, you're addressing something, you're not actually proposing something which has already been done. It's a very easy and quick check to do. You should carefully consider what expertise and experience you need on your research collaborative team. You need to be able to have the people in place who will be able to help you deliver the research project and meet the objectives of the call. So you can, should consider their skill sets disciplines, the different methodology that you're going to require expertise in, etc., and make sure that the appropriate people are included in your application. 
It's important to note that all of the peer reviewers and the panel members are international. So making sure that the Irish research context is explained in your application form is really important. And um, make sure that it's explained appropriately because otherwise the peer reviewers or the panel members may not understand the context completely. Okay, so and that brings us to the end of the webinar, but um, I am Anne Costello. Uh, I, well, I'm happy to answer any questions during the course of your application stage. An FAQ document is available on the webpage, so please do send in your queries and we'll update it if necessary as the call progresses. Uh, we'll break now for just a few minutes and we'll come back to answer some questions shortly. Hello everyone, I think we're back. Um, Annalisa Montesanti is now joining us and we're going to address some of the questions um, that have been submitted. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Annalisa Montesanti. I'm the program manager for the health research career. So I will uh, ask some of the questions that have been um, typed in and sent to us and Anne will answer the questions. So one question is from um, a person that said that he served as assistant, prof assistant and senior lecturer in his own country. Um, between 2015 and 2060 and 2020, but then between 2017 and 2020, he was in unpaid leave, and then he moved to Ireland and got a postdoctoral researcher post. So, as a research, as a postdoctoral researcher, this person is eligible to apply. Uh, but um, I. I'm not entirely sure about the first part because they say that he's still an assistant or senior lecturer until 2020. So there might be some confusion in the in the text. So maybe I would encourage this person to send an email as well just to clarify uh, before he applies. But if generally mm -hmm. if in a researcher uh, in a postdoctoral research position in Ireland is eligible to apply. We would say as well that there's been some um, questions that have been submitted that are kind of case by case. So if you don't hear them, the responses here will follow up with you separately. If you want to contact me and we can assess you on a case by case basis. Then another question, can any research staff, um, for example, research assistant or PhD be hired? Um, yes, under the, uh, yes. So personnel, uh, sorry. I was answering. <laughs> yeah, so you can have personnel on your EIA award, yes. So you can have uh, PhD students, research assistants, even postdocs, if they're justified for the uh, research that you're undertaking. And they would go under the research costs of the uh, budget, not the lead acronym salary costs, which, as I mentioned, is separate. Yeah, so um, in terms of, there is another question about, does the grant support the salary of a PhD student? Um, and do you want to answer? The salary of a PhD student, um, it depends on the PhD students that you're hiring. If, you're hi if you need a clinical um, PhD student uh, under your EIA award, it's going to take up a lot of your, your research funding. Generally, it would be stipended academics because this is the academic career, career path. So you would be supporting academic PhDs to to undertake your academic research. Annalisa, maybe you want to um, add yeah, something so there? you. It can be justified, so we usually pay salary and related costs to clinicians and other health and care practitioner uh, who um, are taking in, in a grant to do the PhD. But yes, they, they are more expensive than a PhD candidate would have 18,000, so, but you can definitely justify, yeah. So next question. Um, does the letter of support have to be signed by the Dean of Research or can it be signed by the Research Office? Or is the norm for be. HRB endorsement in our institution? Yeah, so it's, um, it should, a letter of support should, letters of support should always be signed by Dean of Research. Um, it, or we do say equivalent person as well. So if the Research Office is the person who always signs your re letter of support, you would need to justify that that is an equivalent person to the Dean of Research. So um, maybe that's something you want to follow up with me separately as well, just to be sure. Sorry, I'm just scrolling down some of the question. Um, I'm a research assistant with a PhD uh, in 2016. I'm on a contract position, which was for one year, but now extended until December 2021. Total two years and four months. Am I eligible to apply? Yes, on the basis of your um, 
researcher type. Uh, so you're a researcher, you're not, not a postdoctoral researcher, but you are a researcher and uh, you have a contract of less than two years. So yeah, on that basis, you would be eligible. You would need to check your funding and the other eligibility criteria as well. How many academic researcher applicants did you have in the last round and what was the success ratio? Um, do you remember? I, I So we, we awarded the 11 academic researcher in 2019 and uh, I think was around 20% of success rate. Um, we had a few of the health and care practitioner that uh, applied but nobody was successful. Yeah, and that was part of the reason that we separated the career paths because um, people who are working as clinicians or working in healthcare practice aren't 100% research, so it wasn't fair in terms of the comparison, which is why we now have the two separate career paths, so the assessments are being made um, appropriately. How many awards are available for 2022? Uh, so we'll be making nine awards. Uh, in this round of the call, but there will be two rounds and hopefully over the course of the strategy we'll be able to make up to 18 awards overall between the two calls. Um, if international co-applicants are selected, can PhD be based in those international centres or should they be based in our own institutions? The PhDs would have to be registered in uh, a higher institution in Ireland. They can have time in, in uh, collaborate or co-applicant labs, but they would have to be registered and based up in, in the Republic of Ireland. In this call, as opposed to the 2019 call, it is not mentioned that applications are welcome from lead applicants transitioning from outside health research. What does it mean for applicants, please? Yeah, sorry, that should have been clearer, I guess, in the guidance notes. So we did say that if you wanted to come, uh, if you're on a career break or if you're not working in academia, that you can apply. It does apply also to people coming from disciplines that are not health research that want to transition into health research. So that would be fine. Is there a cap on the number of PhDs taking on within, within, with the grant? Uh, I, there's no cap on the PhD students, but you want to make sure that they're justified and that the the learning there is appropriate in terms of, of your award and of the research. Um, you, will, you obviously have your cap of research costs so that the stipends or the salaries, depending on the type of PhDs they are, uh, will be limited in terms of your research costs, but there's no limit. Is there a maximum years post PhD, which I assume is, refers to the lead applicant eligibility? There is no maximum years post PhD, but we would say that if you are quite a seasoned researcher and you have your PhD quite a number of years ago, you may not be suitable for the call because we are really focusing on emerging investigators. And if it has been quite a while since your PhD, the chances are you're probably already independent or emerged. So you want to um, you want to kind of look at your career in terms of how it will how it will, will look in terms of the assessment criteria because the first assessment criteria at the application stage is is this does this person have potential to become an emerging investigator if you're already emerged then you're not going to do well in that assessment criteria as you won't be suitable but there's no upper limit there is an option to take the award on part-time um sorry just uh... Um, on part-time and allow for other academic activity. If an applicant currently works 50% in academic role and the contract extends beyond two years currently, does that make them ineligible? I guess that would be a case by case. So if you are an academic, uh, if you're a lecturer or somebody who's working in a research organization and you have a 0.5 FTE role and you wanted to take up the award as part time, then it may be possible, but we would need to look at that person's um, situation uh, and, and assess it on a case by case basis. What, what's the difference between co-applicant and collaborators? So it depends really on the research. So co-applicants will be people who have a uh, really a, a relatively substantial role within the project. So they will, will bring the methodology, they'll bring the expertise that you need to, to do your, your uh, research. 
whereas collaborators have a more sort of peripheral role. So it's up to the lead applicants themselves to determine whether somebody should be a co-applicant based on the significance of their role in the programme or whether they should be a collaborator because they're more of, a, they might be a gatekeeper of knowledge or they might be um, a data controller or, or perhaps that person should be a co-applicant because the nature of the research needs that, that person in there. So it really is determined by the lead applicant depending on the type of research that you're proposing. I don't know if you want to add anything there, Annalisa. No, it's fine. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was just looking because I think we are running out of time. Um, So there is one about the scope and uh, it is and the scope states it will not support applications seeking to evaluate an intervention. Can there be no inclusion in a clinical trial in the application? It would depend. You would need to check with us first because if there it, it, if it is a small component but and it doesn't take up the entirety of the research project, it may be okay, but it, it really is something that you need to check with us uh, in terms of how what how of how large a part of the project it is ultimately. But yeah, those we, type of aspects can be included. We support the so, development of an intervention, but we don't support the clinical trial per se because we have the definitive intervention and feasibility studies, the DIFA um, awards. So the clinical trial, um, we cannot support the full clinical trial, but just the develop the develop development, uh, initial development of the intervention, the initial probable testing. So, but the full uh, feasibility pilot or uh, full clinical trial, we will not support through any of the. It's not just the emerging investigator, but it's also other type of like investigator-led projects because we have a specific uh, instrument to support those with uh, expertise in the panels as well. Uh, probably we can go through the last uh, question. Uh, when do you anticipate the second call for the EIA would open? Uh, potentially in 2023, um, but it would depend on the timelines on what else is going on uh, in the portfolio as well. So it's in the diary currently for 2023, but it, that could, that's not um, that's not board approved at this point. So we only know when a call is going to launch after we get board approval for it. So that's when it's due. Um, and we would hope that it would launch sometime in, in 2023. So I think, Annalise, if that's the last question, we might um, we might finish up there, but we'll have a look at all of the questions that have been submitted and we may update the FAQ document. So there'll be a new FAQ document published on the website shortly, um, which will uh, cover anything that, ha that hasn't already been covered in the FAQ document with the guidance notes. And uh, if you do want to contact me, uh, if just please do. Um, and that's that's not a problem at all. It's better to contact me and be sure than write an application and then be uh, ineligible. So please do check those things with me. So thank you very much for attending the webinar and um, best of luck with your applications. Thank you.